Hey guys, Mr. Backer here. In this video, we're going to look at related rate equations. Now, any equation that involves two or more variables that are differentiable functions of time, t, can be used to find an equation that relates their corresponding rates. Suppose that we've got some particle p, which is going to be represented using an x and a y value. It's moving along some curve c that's in our plane, such that its coordinates, x and y, are both differentiable functions of time t. If capital D represents the distance from the origin to wherever our particle is located, then we can use the chain rule to help us find an equation that's going to relate the change in the distance compared to the change in the time to the change in the x value compared to the change in time and also the change in the y value compared to the change in the time. So we're going to find an equation that relates all of these different rates together. Now we're talking about distances, so what we're really going to be using is the distance formula. Now I'm going to sketch out a picture to kind of represent our situation. So we're starting at the origin, and then our particle is moving to somewhere out in our coordinate plane following some curve. And what we're really concerned about is the distance from our p point, which is at some general x and y value, the distance that point is away from the origin. So if we think about the distance formula, when we're calculating a distance, what we want to do is take the square root of, and we're going to subtract the x's. So I'm going to go x minus 0, since we're finding the distance from 0 to x, but then we need to square that. And then we also have to do the same thing with the y's. So we're going to subtract those, but also square that. Now, I don't really need to put those minus zeros in there, so then our distance function that we're working with is the square root of x squared plus y squared. And we're going to use some derivatives in here to help us relate all of these different changing values together based on a changing time. Now, to do this derivative, the first thing I want to do is rewrite this square root as a 1 half power. So I'm going to call this x squared plus y squared all being raised to the 1 half power. Now, as we're doing our derivative, we want to remember that we're differentiating this with respect to the time t. So when I do the derivative of the capital D on the left-hand side, that's going to be the change in the distance compared to the change in the time. Now, doing the actual derivative on the right-hand side using the power rule, I would drop down that 1 half. I would leave the stuff on the inside alone and subtract 1 from the power. But because there is stuff on the inside of our parentheses, we need to use the chain rule. So if I look at differentiating that x squared using the power rule, that's going to turn into 2x. But what we want to remember is that, again, we're differentiating this with respect to t. And we don't necessarily know how x is related to t. So when we differentiate that x, we have to attach a dx dt. And then when we do the same thing with the y's, using the power rule there, we're going to get 2y. But again, we don't really know the function that's relating y based on t. So we need to attach a dy dt to that. So now this equation that came from that derivative relates all of those different values together. We've got the d d dt, the dx dt, and the dy dt all in one equation. So in this example, what we're going to do is find some related rate equations based on some formulas that we already know. So we want to assume the radius r of a sphere is a differentiable function of time t, and we're going to let v be the volume of the sphere. So we want to find an equation that relates dv dt to dr dt. Well, if we think about the volume formula for a sphere, that's volume equals 4 thirds times pi r cubed. So what we want to do is the derivative of this volume function. So on the left-hand side, when we do the derivative of that v, that becomes dv dt. And then on the right-hand side, when we do the derivative of all this stuff, the 4 thirds and the pi are both constants. So those are going to hang on here, so 4 thirds pi. We're going to use the power rule with that r. So we drop the 3 down, and then that becomes r squared. But we want to remember that we're differentiating r with respect to t as well. So we have to attach a dr dt. 
Now there is a little bit of simplifying that we can do in here. We've got a divided by three and a times three right here that are gonna cancel each other out. So then our equation really says dv dt is equal to four pi r squared dr dt. Now in this one, we're looking at a cone, so we're gonna assume the radius r and height h of a cone are both differentiable functions of t, and we're gonna let v be the volume of the cone. So we wanna find an equation that's gonna relate dv dt, dr dt, and dh dt. Well, if we're talking about the volume of a cone, that formula is one-third pi r squared times the height of the cone. Now, as we look at doing this derivative in here, the derivative of v is going to be dv dt because we're differentiating with respect to time. The pi and the one-third are really just constants, so those are going to stay as a constant multiplier in front, but I'm going to write it as pi over 3. And then as we look at this r squared and this h, trying to do a derivative in there, those are being multiplied together. So we're gonna have to do the product rule. So I'm gonna let the r squared be the u value and the h be the v value. So when we're doing the product rule, we wanna leave u the same. So that's gonna stay as r squared, but then we wanna multiply by the derivative of the v. Well, the derivative of h is just 1, but we just did the derivative of h, so we have to attach a dh dt to that. And then plus, now we're going to leave v the same, so I'm going to leave h alone, but we have to multiply by the derivative of u, so using the power rule with the r squared, that's going to be 2r, but I just differentiated my r function, so now I have to attach a dr dt to that. And then there's a little bit of simplifying and rearranging that we can do in here. So we can say dv dt is equal to pi over 3 times. Now I don't really need the 1 in here, so I can just write this as r squared times dh dt. And then on the back end, I'm going to rearrange this just a little bit. I'm going to make it say 2r times h times that dr dt. So now this equation relates all of those other values, dv dt, dr dt, and dh dt. Now, what has always distinguished calculus from algebra is its ability to deal with variables that change over time. So that example that we just went through illustrates how easy it is to move from a formula that relates static variable values to a formula that relates their rates of change. We differentiate the formula with respect to time t. Now our goal here is to not just come up with the equations, but actually solve some problems using those related rate equations. So we've got kind of a general strategy that we can use as we're going through and trying to solve these types of problems. So step number one is to make sure that we understand the problem. And that should be step number one in any problem that we do. So particularly when we're talking about related rate equations, we want to identify the variable whose rate of change we are seeking or that we're trying to find and we also want to identify the variables whose rate of change we already know. Now, step number two, we're going to develop a mathematical model of the problem. And a lot of times that involves drawing a picture because these problems might involve a geometric figure. We're going to label the parts that are important to the problem. We want to make sure that we distinguish constant values from variables that are going to be changing over time. Only constant quantities can be assigned numerical values from the start. Now, step number three, we're going to write an equation relating the variable whose rate of change we seek with the variables whose rate of change we already know. And a lot of times this formula might be geometric in nature, but it could also come from some sort of scientific application as well. Step number four, we're going to differentiate both sides of that equation implicitly with respect to time t, making sure to attach any dx dt or dy dt or any other variable that we're using as we do our derivatives. We want to make sure that we follow all of the differentiation rules, and the chain rule is going to be especially critical because we're going to be differentiating things with respect to a parameter t. 
Now after we do that differentiation, we're going to substitute values for any quantities that depend on time. Now notice that this is only safe to do after the differentiation step. If we substitute things in too soon, then that kind of freezes the picture, which makes changeable variables behave more so like constants. And anytime you differentiate a constant, that's always got a zero derivative. So we want to make sure that we're not substituting values in too soon. We only do that after we do the differentiation. And then lastly, we are going to interpret our solution. So we're going to take our mathematical result and translate it into the problem's setting, making sure that we use appropriate units, and we will decide whether that result makes sense or not. So in this example, we are looking at a hot air balloon that is rising straight up from a level field, and it's being tracked by a rangefinder that is 500 feet away from the liftoff point. At the moment, the rangefinder's elevation angle is pi over 4. The angle is increasing at a rate of 0.14 radians per minute. We want to figure out how fast the balloon is rising at that moment. So if we think about our steps, step number one was to identify which rate we are looking for and also identify any rates that we already know. So we want to figure out how much the height is changing based on the time. So we want dh dt. Now we know that the angle is changing at a rate of 0.14 radians per minute. So we know the change in the angle d theta dt is 0.14 radians per minute. So that's step number one. Identify what we know and what we want to know. Step number two, I'm going to draw a picture to represent this situation. So here is our range finder on the ground. We've got a balloon that is 500 feet away and it's going straight up. Now we don't know the height, that's part of what we wanna find. And we've got this angle in here, theta. I don't necessarily wanna put the pi over four in there for the angle because then the angle's not really changing and we want to talk about this changing angle this d theta so if we plug that value in too quick it's going to freeze the picture but we want to think about the angle as changing sizes now what i want to do with this is use this picture to help us come up with a formula so if we want to relate the height and the angle together we're going to use some trig to help us out so based on where this angle is located the height is the opposite side and the 500 is the adjacent side. So we could say that the tangent of angle theta is the opposite side h over the adjacent side 500. Now we wanna to solve to find dh dt, so we wanna get h alone. So I'm gonna multiply this 500 over to the other side, and I'm also going to flip my equation around. So then it'll say that the height is 500 times the tangent of whatever our theta angle is. Now we want to go through and differentiate this implicitly with respect to t. So if I take the derivative of h with respect to t, I'm going to get dh dt. On the right hand side, the 500 is a constant multiplier, so it stays. We have to do the derivative of the tangent of theta, and the tangent of theta derives into secant squared of theta. But we just did a derivative of a theta variable so we have to attach d theta dt. Now that we've taken our derivative, now it's safe for us to plug in information. So we knew that the angle of elevation was pi over four. So we're gonna use that as our theta angle. We're gonna let theta equal pi over four. And we also knew that the angle was increasing at a rate of 0.14 radians per minute. So we said that d theta dt was 0.14. So we're going to plug in both pieces of information there, which is going to help us solve to get dh dt alone. So this is going to say dh dt equals 500 times the secant of pi over 4, all being squared, but then our d theta dt, that was 0.14. Now, working on simplifying this down, I'm going to start with that secant of pi over 4. That happens to be the square root of 2, but we still have to square that times the 500 and times the 0 
Now the square root of two squared is really just two. The square root and the squared cancel each other out. So we've got 500 times two times 0.14, which gives us an answer of 140. Now we need to take that and translate that into our situation. So this 140, that's our dH dt. So that's how much the height is changing per every time unit. So what we can say, since we're measuring our height in feet, we can say that this balloon is rising at a height of 140 feet per minute since we're measuring our time frame in minutes. Now in this example, we've got a police cruiser that is approaching a right angled intersection from the north. It's chasing a speeding car that has turned the corner and is moving straight east. When the police cruiser is 0.6 miles north of the intersection and the car is 0.8 miles east of the intersection, the police determine using a radar that the distance between them and the car is increasing at a rate of 20 miles per hour. If the cruiser is moving at 60 miles per hour at the instant of the measurement, we want to figure out what the speed of the car is. Now I'm actually going to sketch a picture first, which is going to help me define my variables. So I'm going to let this be my intersection and our police cruiser is directly to the north and our car is directly to the east. Now this is a right angled intersection, so I'm gonna put a right angle in there. This distance from where our police cruiser is to the intersection, I'm gonna let Y represent that value. And the distance from the intersection to where the car is, I'm gonna let X represent that distance. And then the distance between these, I'm gonna let Z represent that. So we want to figure out how fast the car is going. So we're really looking at how much this x value is changing. So we want to find dx dt. Now we know dy dt. We know how fast our police cruiser is going. dy dt. Now the police cruiser is coming towards the intersection. So it's kind of going down on this triangle at a rate of 60 miles per hour. So I'm actually going to call that negative 60 miles per hour since it's going down. And we also know information about the distance between these, about that z value. We know that that distance is increasing at a rate of 20 miles per hour. So we can say our dz dt is 20 miles per hour. Now, looking at this picture that we've got, we want to come up with a formula that's going to allow us to relate all of these values together. And since we're talking about the sides of a right triangle, I'm thinking maybe we should use the Pythagorean theorem. So in this case, it would say x squared plus y squared equals z squared. But then I want to take the derivative of everything in here implicitly, remembering to put the dx dt, dy dt, and dz dt in the right spots. So if we do the derivative of this x squared using the power rule, that's going to be 2x, but we just differentiated an x with respect to time, so we have to attach the dx dt. Now if we look at this y squared, something similar is going to happen using the power rule. We're going to get 2y, but we're going to have to attach the dy dt since we just did a derivative of a y variable. And then on the right hand side, we're going to get 2z, but we have to attach dz dt. Now all of these have a constant multiplier of 2 in front, so we could actually go through and divide them all by 2. Then we would just get x times dx dt plus y dy dt equals z dz dt. And now that we've done the derivative, now it's safe for us to start plugging in the numerical values that we know. So if we look, the cruiser was 0.6 miles north of the intersection. So that y value is 0.6. The car was 0.8 miles to the east, so that x value was 0.8. And because we've got a right triangle, we can actually use both of those values to help us figure out what this z is. 
So z is going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared, and that comes from the Pythagorean theorem. So if we plug in everything we know, we just said that our x value was 0.8, so I'm going to plug that in there. We don't know dx dt, that's what we're trying to solve for, so I'm going to leave that alone in there. We know that our y value is 0.6, and we know the dy dt is that negative 60, so we can plug that in there. On the right hand side, we said that z was going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared, so this is going to be the square root of 0.8 squared plus 0.6 squared, and then we also know that dz dt is that 20. So I'm going to leave the 0.8 dx dt alone. If I take 0.6 times negative 60, that's going to be negative 36. On the right hand side, if I take 0.8 squared plus 0.6 squared, that's 1, and the square root of 1 is just 1, and then 1 times 20 is just 20. I'm going to add that 36 over to the 20, so I get 0.8 dx dt equals 56. And then if I divide the 0.8 over to the other side, then I get dx dt to equal 70. But then we want to take this and translate this mathematical answer into our situation. So this dx dt represented how fast the car was going, and we measure the speed in miles per hour. So we can say that the car's speed is 70 miles per hour. One last example that we're going to take a look at here. Water is running into a conical tank at a rate of 9 cubic feet per minute. Now the tank stands point down and it's got a height of 10 feet with a base radius of 5 feet. We want to figure out how fast the water level is rising when the water depth is 6 feet. So we're trying to figure out how much the height of the water is changing within this cone. So we're trying to find dh dt, how much the height is changing based on the time. Now we know how much the volume is changing. Water is running into the tank at a rate of 9 cubic feet per minute. So we can say the dv dt is 9 cubic feet per minute. Now I'm going to draw a picture in here. So we've got a cone pointed down. So cones have a circular base. This cone is pointing downward. We know that the overall height of the cone is 10 feet, but we're filling this up with water to a certain level, but we don't necessarily know what that level is. So I'm going to call that H. The radius of the whole cone is 5 feet, but as we're filling this up, the radius of the circle that we've got in here is going to be changing. So we're going to need to know what that R value is eventually. Now what I'm going to do is actually separate kind of this triangle out of here, because that's going to help us do a little solving. So we know that this vertical height in here is 10, and we know that this radius for the whole cone is 5. Now what we don't know is as we're filling this up, we don't necessarily know the height at any given point, but we also don't know the radius at that point either. So that's going to create some problems for us as we start taking a look at our volume formula. Because we know that the volume of a cone is one-third pi r squared times the height, and there's really too many variables in there. We don't have any information about how the radius is changing. So we need to somehow get rid of that radius and relate it to a value that we maybe do know some information about or want to know some information about. Using this triangle setup in here, we can actually use some similar triangles to help us set up a proportion to be able to replace the R value with the h value. So this r value compared to the h value from the little triangle should match up accordingly with the 5 and the 10 from the big triangle. Now this 5 over 10 reduces down to a half, so we get r over h equals a half, and we can multiply that h over to the other side, so we really get r equals h divided by 2.
So what I can do with that is I can actually take this and plug it in for R in this volume formula, and then that gets rid of that extra variable that we didn't know any information about. So now we can say that our volume formula is 1 third pi times h over 2 squared times h. Now if I work on simplifying this down a little bit, h over 2 squared is going to be h squared over 4, but then we've got this other h on the end and that 1 third pi in the front. Looking at multiplying these values together, well, with that 1 third and that pi, I'm going to write that as pi over 3, but then if we multiply that by the h squared over 4 times the other h as well, multiplying all of that together, then we're really going to get pi over 12 times h cubed. So this is going to be the volume formula that we use. Now we're going to have to differentiate this formula with respect to t. So this will be dv dt equals, now this pi over 12 is just a constant multiplier, so I'm going to leave that there. Using the power rule back here, we're going to get 3h squared, but then we differentiated an h, so I have to attach a dh dt in here. Now I'm actually going to be able to reduce down this 3 and this 12. So we're going to get dv dt equals pi over 4 times h squared times the dh dt. Now scrolling back up to see the information that we knew, we knew that the dv dt value was 9. That's how much the volume was changing per minute and we were looking at how fast the water level was rising when the water depth was six feet. So this six feet is gonna be our H value. We know that the dV dt value was nine equals pi over four. We're looking at a height of six feet, so we have to square that, but we don't know dH dt. That's what we're trying to find. Well, I know that 6 squared is 36, and I'm going to divide that 36 over to the other side. 9 over 36 reduces down to 1 fourth, so I get 1 fourth equals pi over 4 dh dt. Now, to get rid of this pi over 4, I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal, so I'm going to multiply by 4 over pi to get that to cancel out. The 4s will cancel, so we're left with 1 over pi as our dh dt value, and if we approximate that out to two decimal places, that's about 0.32. So translating this into our situation, at the time in question, when the depth of the water was six feet, we can say that the water level was rising at a rate of 0.32 feet per minute. That's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching.